Monster Professor. Welcome to The Monster Professor, a show in which we discuss and explore monsters in literature, myth, film, games, folklore, culture, and beyond. We're going to dig deep, so be prepared. Did I just say dape? My Kentucky accent's coming through. I'm your host, Josh Woods. I'm an author, editor, an actual professor, but now a monster professor. I got a new microphone, by the way. I hope you can hear an improved audio quality. It sounds better to me already. This is just one more step in a slowly improving podcast. One day, maybe, I'll sound professional. Uh, Until then, I'll fake it as best I can. Today, we're going to talk about monsters and literature, and this is the last of a three-part series. I'm doing three episodes on monsters and literature. In these three episodes, we discussed what I see as the four fundamental stages of what monsters have meant throughout literature. In our first stage, in our first episode, we covered the ancient stage, what I would call stage one, uh, ancient classical pagan, in that the monster was a path to heroism. You make yourself strong enough and courageous enough to fight this monster which is this outside force coming to get you. In that second stage, we moved into medieval, late medieval, early modern, even a little bit modern stage, and what I consider to be monster as religious consequence. And that begins to blur the line. Are the monsters part of us? Did we create the monsters? Are they no longer outside forces? That led us to stage three, when monster becomes personal and existential dilemma, that now we're moved out of the religious sphere and into asking these kinds of questions about what secrets are held back by the universe or by a god that science has defeated. And the way you approach that secret is you either confront the monster or you create the monster or you welcome the monster into your house. That's where the confrontation with the personal and existential dilemma happens. And I think that leads us into the modern era. So let's get to it. Let's see if you can guess which monster this one's going to be. That's right. We jumped to H.P. Lovecraft and Cthulhu which came out with the call of Cthulhu about 1928, although it was stewing in his head a lot longer before that. The correct pronunciation, according to Lovecraft, is something closer to Cthulhu. I think, though, most of us tend to say Cthulhu because it's easier, so let's stick with Cthulhu here. You know you're going to get an entire podcast in the future just over H.P. Lovecraft. So once again, I have to go much faster than I feel comfortable with over uh, Lovecraft and the Cthulhu mythos. We call it the Cthulhu mythos because Lovecraft wrote a bunch of short stories, all of them glimpsing at this deeper mythology that can never be entirely clear, even though a lot of fans and other authors over the years have kind of laid out their version of how it all works. It has something to do with these great, ancient, timeless, cosmic beings, um, many of which are classified as the Great Old Ones. And the most famous of these types of creatures is one who sleeps dead under the ocean on planet Earth. And he's called Cthulhu. As horrifying as he is and as popular as he is, he is little more than a harbinger of the greater great old ones. So he might be a lesser one or perhaps even a priest in in a like John the Baptist type of way. These timeless cosmic horrors, once fully understood, or not even fully understood, once glimpsed, render the entire human condition irrelevant. So they're not 
simply dragons. They're not simply giants, or even gods for that matter. They are beyond our ability to even comprehend or fully classify them. And they're often associated with having tentacles as well, and that's at least what Cthulhu has. He's described as seeming something like an octopus meets a dragon. And so Lovecraft, iconically, is associated with cosmic horror, with tentacles, and with the gothic New England area. He's been wildly influential to horror and gothic writers ever since. And in fact, it's really hard to find any sort of dark horror or any type of gothic since the 1920s that wasn't in some way directly influenced by H.P. Lovecraft. Here's what's most messed up about H.P. Lovecraft to me. When I was first introduced to Lovecraft at a, uh, as an early teen, it was introduced to me as something that, although it was fiction, it was real. Lovecraft understood or saw something through his studies and through his mystical revelations and nightmares that actually other cultures have seen before. And the deeper you get into it, the more it drives you crazy. In fact, when it was introduced to me, I heard that H.P. Lovecraft found out too much about it, went insane, and killed himself. Uh, by the way, the storyline of almost all of his stories is this hapless professor is investigating some weird, disturbing thing, finds out more about it, and then goes insane. And I'm told that that's what happened to Lovecraft. And so other people came later and dug into his work. And there's some truth to that, too. Other writers like August Derelith uh, tried to continue his work. And then other writers beyond that, beyond him... Um, try to continue the stories rather faithfully and I was told that they all went insane and they all killed themselves and if you look at ancient Mayan temples or ancient Incan temples you can see Cthulhu rendered there and all the everything that H.P. Lovecraft has written about has been written about elsewhere and science is suppressing those things we found in, in astrophysics that confirm it and in short that freaked me out at the time, I was reading H.P. Lovecraft and Stephen Hawking's A Brief History of Time, and it's not like Stephen Hawking made anything that H.P. Lovecraft said seem any safer. No, this it was a terrible thing to do to a young, impressionable teen like myself, and it's probably messed me up so much that now, in adulthood, what I'm doing is sitting down in front of a microphone just talking about monsters, because I never could quite get over it. Um, when I first uh, got into H.P. Lovecraft, actually for many years, I mistakenly took him as one of these kind of mystics, as somebody who believes in the supernatural in real life and uh, considers his dreams to be prophetic in some ways. And so I considered him far, far away from the more scientific, skeptical, rationalist type of personality. And I was quite surprised when I found out it's the extreme opposite. H.P. Lovecraft was a hardcore atheist, an absolute materialist, rationalist. In fact, he takes the implications of the modern sciences in his stories way too seriously, or maybe I should say way more seriously than I see anybody else who publicly proclaims to be atheists and uh, or anyone else who proclaims to be an atheist or uh, to only believe in the sciences, right? None of them seem to take their beliefs as seriously as one might think. Um, they seem to go no further than maybe 18th century type of uh, rationalist thinking. Like H.P. Lovecraft looked at geology, looked at biology, astronomy carefully, astrophysics. He even wrote a chemistry textbook, by the way, and as he taught himself text, uh, chemistry and then ended up composing his own textbook. What he did was look at these notions that the universe might indeed be infinite, or even at not too far from his time, people were proposing that it's not just one universe, that there are multiverses. And if the ours isn't ex exactly infinite, 
that the multiverses once considered with it are infinite and that and that time itself is infinite. There wasn't any sort of six days of creation by a simple God and then a seventh day of rest and a, like a 6,000 year old planet. No, these our planet is just a brief glimpse in the wide cosmos. And Darwin says that we just happen to spring up or the implications of Darwin are that life just happens to spring up here and then intelligence like us just happen to come up through natural selection and sexual selection. Lovecraft saw all of that and was horrified. He thought, if we just happen to pop up at this on this little planet in the middle of infinite time and infinite universes, then just think what else has come about that has developed intelligence or things that we can't even conceive of to call them intelligence or otherwise or higher intelligence doesn't even begin to grasp what these other things are. Maybe things so old that they have folded themselves away safely as the universe collapsed and expanded. Maybe these things in our universe are older than the universe itself and they're around us at any given point and at any moment they could rise up and the briefest glimpse of any of these things is to go instantaneously and utterly insane at the concept of your own utter insignificance. That's what his stories are about. And it's a, and it's a really cool fabric to weave tale after tale with. I gotta move away from HP Lovecraft faster. I'm, I'm never gonna get through the other monsters. Okay, promise myself I will do a future only H.P. Lovecraft podcast. Okay, let's jump to 1954 when a book by Richard Matheson comes out called I Am Legend. Talk about an influential book. This was Richard Matheson, by the way, wrote a bunch of th- bunch of stuff. You you might know him as like a writer of some of the original Star Trek episodes, Twilight Zone episodes, the Gremlin Out on the Wing episode is based on one of his stories. And and he and he wrote the screenplay as well. He was a really busy workaday writer. His book, I Am Legend, essentially created the zombie story. In fact, George Romero, uh, reading this book, influenced enough to create Night of the Living Dead, which is something I think now we recognize as much more zombie-like. Because um, Ma- Richard Matheson's book, I Am Legend, was essentially about vampires but they were mindless shambling vampires who essentially just wanted to eat you well what's the difference between that and a zombie not a whole lot in fact that kind of created the zombie especially in this way what richard matheson looked at dracula and you have a whole world of humans and there's one vampire who wants to spread his vampirism so he flipped that concept and said what if we have just one regular human and the whole world is vampires. Let's follow the story of that one person left. And so we've got just one regular old suburban guy named Neville, and during the day, he goes out and slaughters as many comatose vampires as he can through stakes through the heart and all that kind of stuff. And at night, the vampires rise up, so he has to board himself back in his house, and then they shamble around the streets. Some of them who used to knew him or used to know him in life, like his neighbors, will cry out, Neville, Neville. And we have an entire planet full of these mindless undead that he just has to slaughter day after day. It's a deeply anti-humanist story, especially when we get to the very end of it, in which we have the great horror reverse. Some of the more aware zombie vampire creatures end up getting a hold of him and putting him on trial for killing their own kind. And he's like, no, you are the undead monsters. I'm the regular person. I'm the good guy and you're all the bad guys. And they're like, look, you're the only one of your kind left. And you sneak around while we're asleep and slaughter us. Doesn't that make you the monster? And he realizes, oh no, I am the monster. I am legend. And he's executed and dead. Spoiler alert on that one. It was made into a bunch of films. Last Man on Earth with uh, 
with uh, Vincent Price, Omega Man, it, with uh, Charlton Heston. Uh, I mentioned Night of the Living Dead, George Romero's uh, inspired version of it. And then he continued the zombie stories from there. Um, they probably did a Will Smith, I Am Legend at some point. But read the book, I Am Legend. And no film has quite captured how cool this thing is. There's something about that kind of anti-humanist zombie story in which you're surrounded by numberless hordes of people who aren't even really people to you, and you have to slaughter your way through them just to survive. And all you can care about is yourself and maybe your closest family members. Something about that essential story has really spoke, uh, has spoken to modern people because for a long time, especially late 90s through, I don't know, 2015 or so at least, zombie stories have taken over our culture. The Walking Dead not too long ago was the most watched TV show among all TV shows of all time. And it's a, and a story that would otherwise seem kind of fringe for a mainstream. It was the most mainstream story in existence on TV. So there's something I think rather pessimistic of seeing the zombie story as essentially a story of our era. But all of that became, began with Richard Matheson's zombie vampires. Um, it also took a really scientific approach to the what came before, such as Dracula. Dracula itself, Bram Stoker's, was already mixing in science with a kind of occult world. In I Am Legend, it carefully takes time to explain how every little vampire rule is actually scientifically or psychologically based. And so now in the 1900s, we are pulling the monsters out of myth and out of mysticism into the new horrors of the modern age, population, industrialization, uh, globalization, and especially into the sciences, Richard Matheson and H.P. Lovecraft. Time out for a tangent. Personal story tangent. When I was a little kid, this music music videos were kind of new, and this music video came out by a guy named Michael Jackson, and it was called Thriller, and I was scared to freaking death over this thing. I could not I could not watch the entire thing, but. When it came on, I couldn't bring myself to leave the room either, so I would I would hide behind this recliner and cover my eyes, but not my ears, while Thriller was playing on the TV. Because once I saw those zombies, I was absolutely terrified. But I could bring myself to watch the beginnings of it, and I worked my way slowly uh, minute by minute until when I got a little bit older, I was able to watch the whole thing, but something kept happening at the beginning of it. There was this warning. I don't know if it even still exists on YouTube or not, but at the time this warning came up by Michael Jackson before a thriller and it said, due to my strong personal convictions, I wish to stress that this film in no way endorses a belief in the occult. And as a kid, when I read that, I thought, the occult? What's that? Oh, I gotta find out more about this thing. And all that did was just send me straight to finding out more about the occult, at which point I got obsessed with it, and here I am trying to be the monster professor because of that. So, the warning did the opposite, but thanks, Michael Jackson. Tangent done. At this point, let's say mid-1900s, there are so many monsters to pick. It's not just like we have a couple of iconic ones that stand out above all, like we did, say, in uh, 1800s. Now it just comes down to which ones am I going to pick that do something a little bit more than all the other monsters. So I say... For monsters and literature, let's jump to 1971 with a novel that came out by a brilliant writer named John Gardner called Grendel. Grendel is a story about the Beowulf story, but from Grendel's point of view. 
it would seem like at some point a little gimmicky kind of cute I'm the monster story. I'm just trying to get by and this poor, uh, or I'm just a poor monster. And then this mean old heroes come beat me, come to beat me up. Like some of the, you know, the retellings of the old fairy tales, like three little pigs and the wolf, but the wolf tells his side of the story. It's not like that at all. Actually, it's extremely dense and philosophical, sociological, historical, What John Gardner was doing, according to him at least, was trying to explore the most significant concepts of Western civilization, and he considered there to be about 12 of them. The book itself is arranged in 12 chapters. Each of the 12 chapters is arranged according to the Zodiac. And you get you get uh, signs of that. For instance, in the very first chapter, Grendel encounters a ram, and so you know you're beginning with Ares, the zodiac. As you exp- as you explore this novel through Grendel's perspective, you watch Grendel on his own as a monster, uncovering one idea after the other, as Western civilization has. And so Grendel ends up, you know, discovering. Uh, let's say theology and well maybe more like solipsism and then he discovers theology and then he discovers mythology and then materialism nihilism heroism eventually imperialism or or feudalism all the ideas of all the significant uh, ideas that have affected us those of like freud plato Locke, hobbes descartes machiavelli marx nietzsche uh, they all end up becoming discovered by Grendel as he goes along through the ages until he finally uh, has this confrontation with Beowulf. There are many ways to take this novel. Many people have analyzed it carefully and have come to slightly different conclusions. For me, focusing on this as a monster tale, I'm seeing this monster thinking with the human mind, or in other words, a monster is discovering all the significant thoughts of the human mind, which further blurs the line between what's the mind of the monster and what's the mind of the man. Because essentially, John Gardner could have picked any other vehicle for these ideas that he wanted to get across in his fiction. He didn't have to pick a monster. It could have been any other figure from mythology or any other figure from literature. He went with the monster. I think that matters, and I think that's that's what we're going to have to eventually answer in a few minutes um, when we look over all of this whole survey. Why do monsters matter? I think John Gardner gave us one more glimpse at it. Let's pause on that and throw in one last monster. Let's do our last monsters in literature. Again, in the 1900s, it's very nearly arbitrary. Which one am I going to pick? Let me go to 1993. Here comes Hellboy. So Hellboy was created by Mike Mignola, a, a comic book artist and a guy who knows his monster stories and his old myths and folktales quite well. So Hellboy's story is essentially that he's this demon from hell who is summoned by Nazis during the World War II in, with the help of uh, the resurrected Rasputin. And he was summoned to hell to help the Axis powers win World War II. But stuff went wrong. A good guy from the Allies, Professor Broom, his original name looks like Brutinum or something, and it's pronounced Broom. And he adopts Hellboy and raises him to be just a good old blue-collar, hard-working guy. A nice guy. Hellboy takes to that raising, ends up being essentially a blue-collar worker who goes around and fights and stops monsters who are causing trouble. And in fact, the Hellboy tales, in, in many ways, are a return to old pagan heroism, right? Our first stage of monsters, in which we have kind of a, a shirtless, muscular hero with a sword and a heavy fist slashing and punching the bad guys until he wins. Okay, fair enough, but... It flips those kinds of stories on its head in that a lot of those hero stories were 
stories about achieving your destiny or following your destiny, destined for greatness stories. And Hellboys is an anti-destined for greatness story. Every every monster that he confronts sees him for what he is. Hellboy, you're not just some guy who helps out humans by fighting monsters. You were summoned to Earth not only for evil purposes, but as your destiny states you are actually the beast of the apocalypse it will be by your hand that the world is ended and you are that thing that will open the key to the bottomless pit and end all existence as we know it and he sees that destiny uh, confronting him over and over and he rejects it how by just trying not to think beyond the blue collar level. It's a workaday zen. So Hellboy shows us essentially one approach to all of the horrors, say, that we've seen in the modern world, especially once we mix the ancient horrors of monsters and we get more and more uh, to our day and age, which we have all sorts of more complex global horrors. Uh, Hellboy's approach to it is stay humble and do your job and let that be enough. And so don't go chasing after great destinies. I have a lot more to say about Hellboy and a lot more to say about Mike Mignola and what he did to comic books and graphic novels, how he showed us to show stories more than tell them in graphic novels. So much to say, but I can't. I got to move on. Maybe a future uh, purely Hellboy podcast is in order too. So I think let's let's call that the end of stage four and let's call that the end of monsters and literature. But what did stage four mean after we saw stage three monster as personal and existential dilemma ending with uh, concepts like or ending with monsters like the white whale and with Dracula with Frankenstein. Now in the modern era stage four I think we see the monster as us. The monster is us. So I am legend, for instance. I am legend shows us that we are all the monsters now. Every human being on earth has become a monster except for one. And by the end of the book, we're realizing, oh, he is the truest monster of all monsters. And there's no getting away from the fact that you yourself are indeed a monster or Grendel. The monster discovers all of our fundamental ideas. Thus, we think with the mind of the monster, and now the monster is judging us. Or even Hellboy, um, which maybe takes a little bit more optimistic view. Even though he's destined to end the world, his optimistic view is something to the effect of, yeah, we may be the monster. Now, in the modern era, we are the monster just like he is. We're doomed to bring about our own apocalypse just like he is. But we can choose humanity. We can choose to be human. Just the way to do it, do your job, stay humble. Let's call that stage four, the monster as us, is as the end of monsters in literature. But we didn't answer, why do they matter? We saw what they mean throughout time and how that meaning has changed, but why do they matter? So let's briefly explore four brilliant answers to that question. A couple of episodes back, I introduced you to something Tolkien said, J.R.R. Tolkien, author of Lord of the Rings, in his essay about Beowulf, Beowulf and the Monsters and the Critics. Essentially, what he was saying is that when the monster is in a story, it transcends the mundane. It transcends the particular and even glimpses those things which are cosmic and those things that are timeless. Another author, Ursula K. Le Guin, uh, known for her fantasy and science fiction, maybe for her Earthsea series. Um, I, I know her most famously from a book called The Left Hand of Darkness, which is really cool. She wrote an essay uh, called the, um, the Critics, Monsters, and Fantasists, in which, she, although she wasn't exactly exploring monsters, sooner or later in that essay, what she's really trying to get at are these stories that involve inhuman things. And she tells us, uh, I'm paraphrasing essentially, but she tells us 
that m those kinds of stories are anti-anthropocentric, that the stories that are not just about humans or seeing humans in the world, it's not always about you, humans. It's a reminder that humanity is not Lord and master of all. And these kinds of stories very quickly return us to our roots, our roots of being small tribes amid the great unknown. As soon as you have these inhuman things, you're reminded of your place. And again, that's a type of wonderful humility. Um, Elaine Pagels, a scholar, not necessarily fiction, not a fiction writer at all, as far as I know, uh, she's a scholar. Uh, the book I know her from is an excellent one called The Origin of Satan. She says in there that contrasting ourselves as humans against the other as non-human may be as old as humanity itself. In fact, a lot of civilizations who had words for themselves that whatever they called themselves essentially just meant human and anyone who was not part of their group or their tribe were the uh, were the inhumans or the others right and so this way of understanding yourself only by contrasting against those things that are non-human in our case monsters that's the fundamental way of understanding who you are your own identity or your own identity um, the philosopher William James, brother to the fiction writer Henry James, who wrote an excellently disturbing and scary gothic ghost story called The Turn of the Screw. The brother, William James, said to study the abnormal is the best way of understanding the normal. I think those are at least four really good answers to that tough question. So why do monsters matter? Time out for a question from the audience. At one of these live events, somebody asked, well, if those are the four stages of monsters that take us up to our current day and age, then what's the fifth stage going to be? What do you think the future holds for monster tales? Oh, I have no idea. I have no idea. I'm, in fact, I'm not necessarily sure how far... We can go into new realms uh, that don't involve standing on the shoulders of giants, right? These all the past greats and mixing them and matching them in in ever changing ways. I don't think we necessarily have to progress to a new stage in order for our monster stories in the future to stay amazing and to stay fresh and and most important to continue to matter to us. Um, but maybe it will. Maybe it will go in a new direction. I have no real idea, but I can say this, that no matter what happens a hundred years from now, a thousand years from now, four thousand years from now, if there are humans still on planet Earth, there will still be monster stories. We will still be telling monster stories and it will matter to us somehow in the deep back parts of our brains and our in our hearts and maybe at the front of our brain as I'm trying to bring it up now with this kind of analysis as the monster professor. Um, but even if that kind of thing fades away, we will still be telling monster stories. Tangent done. The question might come up at this point, well, Monster Professor, if that's what you think of all these other people's monster stories, then what about you? What if you had the chance to tell a monster story? What would your monsters be like? What would your monster story mean? Or what, it would, what would it seem like? Well, I took that chance. I wrote a book called The Black Palace. It's available right now on Amazon.com. So check it out if you want to see my take on monsters. This will conclude our three-part episode series of Monsters and Literature. We went from the Epic of Gilgamesh to Hellboy in only three roughly 40-minute podcasts. I think that's a big task, and I think let's call it accomplished. Mission accomplished there. So the next podcast, we get to focus on one concept, one feature, one type of monster at a time. I've got a ton planned, but if you have some requests for me, then drop me a line. Check me out on my website, joshwoodsauthor.com. There are ways to get a hold of me there. 
and it doesn't have to be only a request for a whole episode, although I've already been getting a lot from a lot of people. Every idea I've heard so far has been really cool. They're like, dude, you should do an episode on this. You should do an episode on that. I'm like, yep, 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 I should. It's all going on the list. And it doesn't have to be just an episode request. You can throw a question at me, a smaller question that I can include in a podcast. I'll answer it in my way, which is a mix between the best answer I can provide and the most entertaining answer to me that I can provide. So thank you so much for listening to this episode of The Monster Professor and the conclusion of Monsters and Literature. Now, which podcast will be our next one? Which do you think it will? I'm not sure if I'm going to give you any hints about which one it will be. I'll see you next time. Thanks for listening to The Monster Professor. Professor.